And I don't want to gross you out. I'm sorry you're having lunch, but I can tell you the statistic anyway. If you take 300,000 people times 185 ounces of blood per person, and you divide it into the number of barrels of oil exported by Sudan over the same period of time, it works out to 6.5 milliliters of blood in every barrel, which is, well, this is 4.2 milliliters by comparison. This much blood in every single barrel. As much blood is in your big toe, as much blood is in your eye. There is blood oil in the world. And you know what? Even if our oil, in, in the oil sense, had an extra pound of CO2 per barrel, I don't want any Sudanese blood in my oil, thank you very much. And that, unfortunately, is the norm in the world. Iran is using its oil money to build a nuclear bomb to threaten the West. Hugo Chavez is using his oil money to threaten Colombia and crack down on opposition newspapers and radio stations. Russia is using its oil money to re-equip its armed forces to rebuild the KGB, now called the FSB, to invade Georgia. I don't want to give my oil money to them. Are those morally superior sources than us? Well, how about then my third criteria? Economic justice for the working man. I think the second one's easy. We're the most peaceful people in the world. We give foreign aid. Nigeria, let's talk about uh, economic justice. Nigeria, in many ways, the richest country in the world. Could they be blessed with more resources? And they've all been, also been the number one recipient of foreign aid. What kind of genius does it take to, world's, to take the world's natural bounty and the world's largest foreign aid donations and turn that into one of the poorest countries in the world? Life expectancy, 47. One out of every two Nigerians lives on less than a dollar a day. Where did all the money go? Like, where did it go? Well, you can ask the Nigerians themselves, and they'll tell you. The Nigerian government's own commission on corruption calculates that since 1960, $366 billion was stolen by their dictators and bureaucrats and secreted in Swiss banks. That works out to $18 a barrel. Every barrel ever sold from that country. Fort McMurray, I don't need to tell you. I don't need to tell you. You can make $100,000 driving a truck up there. I had lunch with a fellow who was talking about $200,000 a year welders at the height of the boom in 2008. Whether you're union or not, it's lifting a whole country up. There are more people in Ontario working for the oil sands in Ontario with heavy equipment manufacturing or Bay Street finance jobs. Those are six-figure jobs too, by the way. More people working for the oil sands in Ontario than work for the big three automakers. You shut down the oil sands, God forbid, your unemployment rate in Ontario jumps by half a point just from the direct unemployment. Senator Bill Romkey, the liberal from Newfoundland, stood up in the Senate three weeks ago and said in many communities in Newfoundland, 50% of the income comes from the oil sands. I was in Halifax and I met a union organizer from Cape Breton. When I was a kid, Cape Breton was synonymous with unemployment. He said that just the union guys alone in Cape Breton bring home three to six million dollars a week net. Just the union guys. It's the best thing that's ever happened, and that's, just not, that's not just an economic uplift. That is a moral and spiritual blessing for a fellow to be able to go out and work very hard and provide for his family in a way that he could never do before, rather than sitting around waiting for a new TAGS program for Ottawa, waiting for the COD to come back, sitting in his basement and thinking, what kind of a man, I can't earn a living. It's, it's such a moral blessing for these families. There's a new spirit in Newfoundland that I think is largely attributable to the success of the oil sands. And I think that's trickled into this province too. You've earned everything here. Your smart policies, how you have earned your success here too. But part of the success is that the oil sands have lifted the entire country's economy. Well, what about my last point, human rights? Well, this is the easiest one, isn't it? You know, the mayor of Fort McMurray is a young woman named Melissa Blake. Completely unremarkable in Canada. I mean, we've been electing women to parliament for almost 100 years. How many young women mayors are there in Saudi Arabia? There are none. It's against the law to be a young woman mayor in Saudi Arabia. It's against the law to vote if you're a woman in Saudi Arabia. It's against the law to drive a car if you're a woman in Saudi Arabia. It is against the law to get elective surgery without the permission of your husband in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is a terrible place for women. And one of the things that Zoe told me she cares about deeply is the equality of men and women. Zoe, it's not just that. Because Mayor Blake is, is living with her fiancé, completely normal and remarkable in Canada, in Iran, one of the world's largest oil producers. That is against Sharia law, she be stoned to death. And that's not just some history books thing, that is happening in the news today. How about Aboriginal people? The number one employer of Aboriginal people in Canada is the oil sands. And these are not fake work, make work projects. These are outstanding jobs. And, and the oil sands have been around so long that it's now fathers and now their sons 
are coming to work, and it's breaking that cycle of dependency. It's outstanding. Look, the oil sands are not perfect. Of course they're not. No human endeavor is perfect. No industrial enterprise is perfect. But when environmentalists say shut down the oil sands, they're, what they're actually saying is, I want you to send the problems to other countries. I want to outsource the pollution to a Nigeria where they don't care. I want to outsource the treatment of workers to Venezuela where they don't care. They're actually engaging in nimbyism, not in my backyard. I don't want to hear about 230 ducks dying. I'd rather have 300,000 dead in Darfur because I don't have to worry about it. If I don't see it, it didn't happen. That is against the liberal maxim, think, lo think globally, act locally. Every barrel of oil that we produce in Canada is one less barrel sold by the terrorists of Saudi Arabia, the dictators of Venezuela and Nigeria, the misogynists of Iran, the union busters like Hugo Chavez, the butchers of Darfur. And so if you believe in these four liberal values, the environment, including carbon dioxide, peace, economic justice and a fair wage, and human rights, you must come to the same conclusion that I do that the moral thing for this country is actually to produce as much oil as we can. We'll never be able to produce enough to put the Saudis out of business, I regret. But right now, every single day, we sell 1.4 million barrels a day to the states. That's 100 million bucks a day that's coming to us to spend on hospitals and schools and peacekeepers so Afghan girls can go to school. We're doing good things with the money. You know that because you're living it. We spend our money ethically. We don't steal it and put it in the Swiss bank account. A hundred million dollars a day that we're getting that's not going to the bad guys if we gave in to the David Suzuki's of the world and shut down the oil sands, God forbid. Do you think our American customers for one second would go without filling up their cars? The question is not what is the fantasy fuel of the future that one day I can fill my car up with. You know, I hope it's invented. I hope one day there is a super fuel like dilithium crystals or what was it called in Avatar? Unobtainium. That's what they called it. I hope one day we invent such a miraculous fuel that has no side effects, everyone can afford it, and you can run jets on it. But right now, a windmill ain't going to power your jet plane. And until that day comes, it is morally unserious to compare the oil sands to some fantasy future. The only morally serious comparison is between oil sands oil and its competitors, which means OPEC. And the, that means oil sands oil versus Saudi oil. And I think that our Canadian character, which, which I think is defined in part by caring for the environment, loving peace, paying people fairly, treating workers fairly, and respecting others. I think that's actually a very Canadian list, isn't it? A little bit liberal in its phraseology, but I think every conservative can sign on to those things. There's another part of the uh, Canadian identity. Being deferential, being modest. You know, being humble is outstanding as a character trait in an individual. One day I'll know what that feels like. But <laughs> as a country whose competitors are the butchers of the world, being humble and modest is not an advantage, it is a disadvantage. And so when the James Camerons fly up here, the Nancy Pelosi's fly up here to lecture us, it's not enough just to teach them. We have to say, all right, if not oil sands oil, then what? Then what's in your gas tank? What do you say is morally superior? And until they have a better answer than I don't know, the answer must be ethical oil, the fair trade coffee of the world's oil business. Thanks for hearing me.